Thirteen. Living backwards. Living backwards? Alice repeated in great astonishment. I never heard of such a thing. Lewis Carroll, through the looking glass. The whole point of therapy is to talk about the things that you don't want to think about, the secret truth about your family, your feelings, and yourself. The most helpful, wonderful thing you said to me was that whatever happened, whatever feelings I had to face, you wouldn't leave me alone with them, that we would work through it together. That is what I tell my children, and that's why I've been able to be a very different kind of mother than my mother. Laura joked that she lived life backwards, creating the kind of childhood for her children that she needed for herself. She was unaware that in trying to please her mother, she had abandoned herself. Laura was determined not to repeat the dynamic with her own children. I recommended Alice Miller's book, For Your Own Good, because Laura needed validation and support for her feelings. She eagerly read the book and brought it to several sessions, Miller's words stirred up a great deal of anger and sadness for Laura, particularly the following passage. Loving parents should want to find out what they are unconsciously doing to their children. If they simply avoid the subject and instead point to their parental love, then they are not really concerned about their children's well-being, but rather are painstakingly trying to keep a clear conscience. This effort which they have been making ever since they were little, prevents them from letting their love for their children unfold freely and from learning something from this love. Miller encourages grown children to express their anger and pain to their parents, not in order to punish or change the parent, but because doing so is the only way of developing an authentic relationship. But children with borderline mothers must decide for themselves whether or not to risk such openness. The danger of being silenced, of being discounted, perpetually looms over the child. What matters most is that the cycle of BPD can be stopped through the way the borderline's children parent their own children. Adult children of borderlines must heed the advice of Margaret Little. An important element in the integrity of the parents is their willingness to take full responsibility for their child right from the time of conception, whether it was consciously intended or not, acknowledging that he did not ask to be conceived or born and therefore has a right to his existence and individuality without demands on him to pay emotionally or otherwise for his keep or to be grateful. Like Alice in Through the Looking Glass, the Borderline's children sense the presence of another world where they can reverse the reality of their own childhood. Masterson observes that the borderline remains perplexed and cannot see through the defensive structures of his life, his thinking, his way of perceiving reality. He senses but cannot understand the hollow core at the center of his life. He has lived too long on deception, fantasy, and the myths of the false self. Yet many borderlines enter therapy during middle age, when the hourglass is half empty, time is slipping away, and the compromised life triggers existential depression. Children of borderlines are also likely to enter therapy at midlife, anxious to free the real self. Although therapy does not cure the borderline, gaining insight understanding and validation may prevent a borderline mother from passing the disorder to her children. Miller writes that if a mother could feel how she is injuring her child, she would be able to discover how she was once injured herself and so could rid herself of her compulsion to repeat the past. Many borderline mothers seek treatment because they know their behavior is destructive to their children. Those who do not know and those who do not want to know are most at risk for passing the disorder to the next generation. But as Miller observes, it is quite simply not true that human beings must continue compulsively to injure their children, to damage them for life, and thus destroy our future. False Beliefs James Thurber's comical tale, The Unicorn in the Garden, 
depicts the battle for sanity experienced all too frequently by children of borderlines. In Thurber's story, a man discovers a unicorn eating roses in his garden and rushes to the bedroom to wake his wife. There's a unicorn in the garden eating roses, he declares. His wife glares at him contemptuously and remarks that everyone knows that unicorns do not exist. The man rushes back out to the garden and feeds the unicorn a lily. Again, he tries to rouse his wife and tell her of the miraculous event. Growing annoyed, his wife calls him a booby and announces that she is going to put him in the booby hatch. After her discouraged and insulted husband leaves the house, the wife phones the police and a psychiatrist, demanding that they hurry to the house with a straitjacket. When the psychiatrist and police arrive, she tells them her husband's story about the unicorn. When her husband returns, the psychiatrist asks, Did you tell your wife that you saw a unicorn in the garden? Of course not, the man answers. Everyone knows that there is no such thing as a unicorn. The psychiatrist informs the man that his wife is crazy and instructs the police to take her away to the booby hatch. The borderline's grown children often feel like the characters in Thurber's tale. Sometimes they feel like the husband, hoping to share their excitement and wonder, but are discounted, discredited, and disbelieved. At other times, they feel like the wife, fed up with wild stories, fabrication, and deceit. Regardless of which way they turn in the emotional labyrinth, they end up feeling crazy. Their lives are filled with false beliefs, mythology, fantasy, fabrication, distortion, and deceit. But you know she loves you. When the good mother within the borderline holds and comforts her young child, the child's well-being is temporarily restored. Darkness within the mother, the self, and the universe becomes light. The chaos is organized. The void is no longer without form as day is separated from night and the wind and the waters become calm. Why the storm has passed makes no difference to the young child, who is simply grateful to return to paradise in the good mother's arms. From there, the small child sees, for the moment, that the world is good. Unfortunately, the good mother is a fleeting ego state, and the storm inevitably returns. By the time her children grow up, they may fear the good mother, because chaos always returns. Concentration camp survivor Primo Levi wrote, Compassion and brutality can coexist in the same individual and in the same moment, despite all logic. At a very early age, children of borderlines know that there is something wrong with their mother. Music theorists use the term counter-discourse to describe the profoundly disturbing experience of receiving a message in which one parameter of a communication is at variance with another. For example, hearing a piece of music that was written to be played with soft elegance played harshly and loudly. Equivalent human experiences include a crushing embrace, an eerie smile, or an icy compliment. The visceral reaction is unbearable as the brain struggles to process two conflicting experiences. When a preschool teacher observed a three-year-old boy chewing gum in class, the teacher walked calmly over to the child and said sweetly, Tommy, do you have chewing gum in your mouth? Unabashed, the little boy looked up at her and answered honestly, Yes, Mrs. Baker, my mommy gave it to me. Still smiling and talking softly to the child, the teacher said, Tommy, I want you to take the gum out of your mouth and place it at the end of your nose. You get to wear the gum on your nose today. Contentment fell from the child's face as he studied his teacher, trying to process the counter-discursive message. His faith deeply shaken, he dutifully obeyed his teacher's instruction while laughter broke out in the classroom. Young children have no choice but to tolerate mistreatment by adults. Someone else must notice. Someone else must help. As a child, Laura hoped that her aunt might notice her mother's bizarre behavior. Her aunt, however, frequently told Laura how lucky she was to have a mother who loved her. She told Laura that she needed to build her mother's self-esteem, reinforcing the pathological role reversal. 
Adults who still idealize their own abusive parents are unable to acknowledge the absurdity of being asked to trust someone you fear. No one expects prisoners of concentration camps to trust their captors. Children of borderlines are often told, your mother loves you, that's just the way she is, she didn't mean it, or she can't help it, as if children should ignore their own intuition that tells them they have been hurt. These messages not only encourage repression of legitimate anger and pain, but also lead children to believe that their mother's behavior is acceptable. Tolerating inappropriate or abusive behavior requires the betrayal of the self. Young children have no choice, but grown children do have a choice. When grown children tolerate abuse, they reenact the sacrifice of the self. Hopefully, they would never expect their own children to tolerate cruelty, deception, or mistreatment. Something is wrong if we fear the person who loves us. Anyone who encourages us to trust a person we fear does not have our best interests at heart. Can she help it or not? Because children of borderlines feel both pity and fear for their mother, they do not know if they are entitled to express their feelings about her behavior. They may ask the therapist, can she help it or not? The answer is both yes and no. Yes, she can learn to control her behavior when she realizes that negative consequences will follow. On the other hand, she is not able to change the way she feels. Although underlying feelings of desperation, fear, anger, emptiness, and rage do not change, her behavior can. The irony is that her fear of abandonment gives her adult children the power to structure the relationship. An aging mother needs her adult children more than they need her. The borderline mother's fear of abandonment gives adult children the power to preserve the relationship by structuring it around their own needs. They must live life backwards. Living Backwards Oh, Kitty, how nice it would be if we could only get through into Looking Glass House. I'm sure it's got, oh, such beautiful things in it. Let's pretend there's a way of getting through into it, somehow, Kitty. Through the Looking Glass Children of borderlines cannot understand themselves without first understanding their mothers. Although infant and mother mirror one another, the interaction is a matter of survival for the infant. Gopnik and colleagues explained that understanding the people around you is part of becoming a particular sort of person yourself. As children learn what other minds are like, they also learn what their own minds are like. Children of borderlines are not sure what their own minds are like and are frightened by what they see in their mother. Gopnik and colleagues also observe the wide eyes that sometimes seem to peer into your very soul actually do just that, deciphering your deepest feelings. Children of borderlines try to avoid seeing their mother's darkness. Although they sense their mother's helplessness, emptiness, fear, and anger, they develop defenses that prevent them from drowning in anxiety. Attachment researchers report that when a child has an anxious, avoidant attachment, she tends to behave as if the caregiver were not in the room. These studies indicate that children whose mothers are sometimes withholding but other times nurturing are most likely to become extremely dependent and anxious adults. By the time children of borderlines become adults, they behave as if their mother is not in the room. They may ignore her even when they are with her, in order to reduce anxiety. Or they may spend their entire lives consumed by her neediness. With the help of a therapist, however, adult children can create more comfortable relationships so that they no longer need to pretend that their mother is not in the room. Therapy helps adult children hold on to their true selves, even in their mother's presence. Recreating the Self Although everyone possesses some false self-beliefs, borderline mothers hold unique combinations of false beliefs derived from their childhood experience. Unfortunately, their view of the world, themselves, and their children 
is hardwired into the brain and is difficult to change. An adult's false beliefs about the self are difficult to change partly because an adult's brain is less responsive to learning than a child's brain. Treating a borderline mother, therefore, is more difficult and time-consuming than treating her child. Developmental researchers explain that young children create internalized working models that are systematic pictures of how people relate to one another, theories of love, like scientific theories, they can be changed with enough new evidence. As children get new information about how people work, especially how people work together in intimate ways, they modify their own views. Even abused children often seem to escape long-lasting damage if there is somebody around who doesn't turn away. Although neuroscientists report that the lack of consistently warm, responsive care during childhood alters the brain's biochemistry, they have also discovered that the brain's plasticity allows new neural pathways to continue to develop in response to new situations and experiences. Masterson refers to the therapist as the guardian of the real self. Long-term difficulties with intimate relationships result because of the split in the perception of the mother as well as the self. The good me is compliant, obedient, immature, and passive. The bad me wants to grow, to separate, to explore the world, to be autonomous and adventuresome. The good mother approves of the good child, while the bad mother disapproves of the bad child. The good mother supports and encourages the regressive behavior, while the bad mother grows hostile, critical, and angry when confronted with the child's assertive behavior. The child's belief that the good me must not be assertive results in an unfulfilled life. Changing false self-beliefs requires rerouting neural pathways. Although borderline mothers and their children can benefit from the use of antidepressants and anti-anxiety medication, long-term therapy is needed to rewire neural pathways in order to perceive the self and the world more positively. The safety of a therapeutic relationship allows the real self to surface without the fear of being judged, criticized, or misunderstood. Laura no longer needed to repress her pain or her rage, and therefore did not project it onto her own children. She learned the difference between fear and love and was determined to raise her children with empathy and compassion for their true selves. She mourned with genuine sadness the losses she experienced in her own childhood and felt a strong sense of entitlement to enjoying her children's childhood. Children of borderlines may spend their entire lives trying to understand their mother and themselves. They are preoccupied with sorting out the meanings of interactions, studying their own perceptions, and questioning the intentions of others. Helene Deutsch, the first leading female member of Freud's Vienna Society of Psychoanalysts, was drawn to studying the theme of phony identity and inauthenticity because of her resentment toward her own mother. Children of borderlines must work through intense feelings of rage not only toward their mothers, but also toward their fathers. Masterson comments on the significance of the absent father in the stories of Snow White and Cinderella. The absence of a father in these stories replicates the real-life drama of children with borderline mothers. The father's failure to intervene in the pathological dynamics between mother and child can leave the child with fantasies of being rescued from the ongoing battle for emotional survival. The father, however, is often torn between loyalty to his wife and loyalty to his children. The borderline wife's retaliatory rage and sensitivity to abandonment can leave both father and child fearful and torn between the objects of their love. The borderline's children often repress their anger at their fathers and are not able to express these terrifying feelings until deep into therapy. Idealization of the father prevents depression and rage from surfacing and protects the child from feeling orphaned. Without treatment, children of borderlines may never accomplish the crucial task upon which their survival depends, understanding their mother. 
Maternal depression is known to interfere with the part of the brain associated with the expression and regulation of emotions, and chronic stress can result in chronic illness. Therapists note that no good adult children of borderline mothers often suffer from autoimmune disorders, such as lupus, scleroderma, chronic fatigue, or fibromyalgia. Unconscious muscle rigidity from living in a chronic state of fear may eventually take a physical toll. The nature of the attachment with one's mother has a decisive and pervasive impact on the self, both physically and emotionally. Adult children of borderline mothers must return to the past for the sake of their future. The last half of their lives can become the best half if they disinter the real self and rediscover their lost exuberance, their own free will, and their uninhibited creative self. Many adult children who enter therapy report disturbing dreams of returning to high school, feeling ashamed to be middle-aged, and having to catch up on something they miss learning. In these dreams, they report feeling angry, resentful, and embarrassed that no one had given them proper instructions or clearly explained the assignment. They unconsciously know that they missed a developmental step during adolescence, that they were not adequately prepared for separation and individuation. Their anxiety focuses on not knowing what to do, feeling lost and left behind. Therapy is the only course to take. No greater gift exists than a life of unrestrained love and joy. The relationship between therapist and patient provides the diploma needed to graduate to a brighter world. Finding the Light Each new day brings us closer to untangling the complex web of BPD. As threads of various disciplines are woven together, researchers may soon discover more effective treatment for the cognitive and emotional dysfunction that characterizes BPD. Freud wrote, The assumption that everything past is preserved holds good even in mental life only on condition that the organ of the mind has remained intact and that its tissues have not been damaged by trauma or inflammation. Neuroscientists now know that people who suffer childhood trauma may suffer from persistent hyperactivity in certain regions of the brain, and that the brains of individuals who suffer from PTSD differ from those with depression. There is every reason to hope that BPD can be prevented, if not someday cured. Although childhood trauma and loss cannot be prevented, allowing children to express their grief fully and openly may prevent BPD. Children who are allowed to express overwhelming emotion will not drown in grief. Lewis Carroll conveyed the child's feelings in Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. I wish I hadn't cried so much, said Alice, as she swam about, trying to find her way out. I shall be punished for it now, I suppose, by being drowned in my own tears. Children need to be held, to be mirrored, to be soothed, and to be given some control throughout their childhood, but especially following separation and loss. Unbearable pain that is expressed, heard, and believed becomes bearable. The ideal mother lovingly accepts the child's true feelings, rage and all, because she faced her true feelings about her own upbringing. Although such a mother is rare, children of all ages know one when they see one. Every Sunday I watch groups of small children flock around an 81-year-old woman in our church. Harriet's radiant smile reflects the love she feels for all children, and her belief in their basic goodness. I once asked her to tell me about her own mother. Tears filled her eyes as she told me that her widowed mother raised five children during the Great Depression. The center of Harriet's universe was an unfailing source of warmth and light. After our brief conversation, Harriet sent me a copy of a cherished poem written by her mother, apparently entitled Motherhood. O oh, youth, I would be mother to you all. I know so well your deepest, direst needs, who have been mother to daughters and sons, and learned to comprehend their thoughts and deeds. 
I am so thankful that no bounds are set on this estate so very near divine, but reaches world around and comes to fruit, wherever needs of yours reach needs of mine. In this there are no ties of blood or state, the blessed gift of motherhood can't bind. O oh, youth, I would be mother to you all, and make those needs of yours meet needs of mine. Mrs. Katie Martin The blessed gift of motherhood knows no bounds. No ties of blood or state exist where the emotional needs of children are concerned. Healthy love is contagious. It is passed from one generation to the next, just as BPD is passed to future generations. One of Harriet's most precious memories is the day she was baptized by immersion in the stream on her family farm. She wrote, After my immersion on the most beautiful warm June day, and as the minister led me to the edge of the stream, there was my wonderful mother, holding a soft cotton blanket, and she so lovingly enfolded me in her arms and held me so tightly that I felt great love approval, and safety in her arms. I do believe that part of the memory is even more significant and meaningful than the actual baptism. Harriet had no fear of drowning, as she was led to the edge and engulfed by water because she knew that her mother was watching. She trusted her mother completely, the opposite experience of children with borderline mothers. Make-believe mothers are not hard to find in reality, although others may pretend not to see them. Although most people know someone who exhibits symptoms of BPD, few people have the courage to intervene. A patient who was raised by a borderline mother witnessed a mother belittling her child in a grocery store. The patient was filled with rage toward the mother and sadness for the child. After carefully weighing the consequences of intervening, she followed the mother to the checkout and said, you are so lucky to have such a wonderful child. I can see how much he loves you and how important your love is to him. I'm sure it isn't easy being a parent. Then she turned to the child and said, You're a good little boy. The mother was momentarily speechless. Finally, she muttered, Thank you. And as she walked out of the store, the patient noticed that her tone of voice was softer and she saw a smile spread across the child's face. The patient had the courage to be honest, yet gentle, with a mother and child who needed help. She replaced the mother's negative projections with a positive perspective of her child and gave the child a positive view of himself, at least momentarily. Such experiences provide light in the midst of darkness for both mother and child. If we could remember our own childhood wish that some adult, somewhere, might notice our pain, perhaps we could follow in this patient's footsteps. We must move beyond asking, why didn't somebody do something? We must ask why we do nothing when children are abused in front of our own eyes in the grocery store, at the airport, or in the shopping mall. For five years, an elementary school art teacher observed an obese fifth grader bullying and being bullied by his peers. Every day she had witnessed violent language exchanged by the student and his peers. I'm going to get my gun and shoot you, the student threatened. We'll shoot you back, his classmates taunted. Two weeks before the end of the school year, just before the student's graduation to middle school, the teacher sacrificed her lunch hour to speak to him. She called the young boy to her room and said, Damon, I don't give up my lunch for just anyone, but I want you to know that you have one person who believes in you. You are smart. You have a lot of potential. But if you don't learn to ignore people who pick on you, you'll be dead before you get to high school. I don't want to read your name in the obituaries. Six years later, the teacher received a phone call from the local school board inviting her to attend a ceremony honoring Damon as the most at-risk student to graduate in the top 10% of his high school class. 
At the ceremony, Damon announced to the audience that the one person who had made a difference in his life and changed the way he saw himself was his elementary school art teacher. He described this pivotal moment. Our lunch hour talk near the end of fifth grade was the first time in my life that anyone had said they believed in me. I believe in you are words that make-believe mothers and their children need to hear. Believing in the self is the key to healthy self-esteem and mental health. Borderline mothers cannot give their children this gift because they never received it themselves. Without intervention, their emptiness, hopelessness, rage, and fear will be passed to the next generation. The British philosopher Edmund Burke claimed that the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Borderline mothers are not evil. Evil lies in the darkness of unawareness. They cannot see what they are doing. Those of us who can see must shine the light of our understanding like a beacon guiding a ship to harbor or share in the responsibility of allowing mothers to drown their own children in a sea of despair.